Welcome and good evening, fellow kindred. Tis I, Toreador Troubadour. Though I have on occasion been mistaken for both a Tremere and even a Bruja, if you can believe such things. I am your overall friendly and fashionable and ever so clever thin blood scholar. I know, it's quite a mouthful, but don't you worry. You just sit back in your lovely pleated armchair, and I'll do the rest of the talking. Today, I hope to begin a new series of orations of the Book of Nod, so that we might begin to break down kindred culture and society throughout the ages. And while a priest might start with the Book of Genesis, I will regard you, fellow kindred, to the Book of Nod, though unlike a priest, I will warn you. Take the scriptures before you with a grain of salt. Many factions have arisen from its teachings, and even more have grown heretical to the masquerade as a whole in their interpretations of the book, such as the Sabbat, or even more so the Black Hand, both sects of which are a topic of discussion for another time. Before I even touch upon the preface, understand that this text was written, and more so compiled, by the renowned Aristotle de Laurent, and his equally capable apprentice Beckett. So again, like the mortal gospel, this text was gathered and written in what I can only politely say as haphazardly. No matter, with that understood, we can move forward and focus on the text as both a historical and a philosophical piece, while not holding it on such a divine pedestal as to not be able to question or challenge the information it presents us. And my main reason for being so secular upon the issue is twofold. On one hand, the path of humanity of which the masquerade endorses strictly contradicts certain teachings that one could derive from the Book of Nod, especially if one were to take the text at a face value. The other reason is that there are simply other, well kindred we'll call them for now, that are very evidently not of the line of Cain, whether it's the Quajin of the East, which are rarely referred to as kindred, or the rarely spotted drowned legacies of the Americas, which purportedly can blend in with kindred society, like we blend into mortal society. Cain's legacy only accounts for bloodlines that originate in the Middle East, Europe, and the Slavic regions. Even certain African lineages are debatable these nights, as more and more of the Ebony Kingdom show signs and traits not entirely derived of Cain. European kindred for a very long time expressed feelings that the Ebony Kingdom was simply a single clan from Cain's lineage, but with a couple of different names and forms of clanship, but as of recent scrutiny, that Eurocentric proposed idea is swiftly beginning to crumble. My point is that as we currently understand, the reality that these forms of vampires exist, and yet the Book of Nod would claim that all vampires come from Cain, is in itself contradictory deeming none of these foreign kindred seem to share primary traits of Cain's blood. I have my own theories on the matter, but before I can even begin to divulge these upon you, I am eloquently obligated to educate you first on the world, background, and history of kindred society. So without further ado, let us begin. We'll start with the preface as written by De Laurent. I cannot tell you the naked fear I feel, putting down these words for once and for all. Perhaps I will regret them, perhaps they will never see print, yet it is my nature to report this. It is as they say, in the blood. My sire and his sire before him followed this great and glorious work. Indeed, our very nature has been shaped by this quest. We are unable to stop searching for knowledge. We are of the Nemocene, the memory seekers. Specifically, we have been commanded to search for the book the Tome of All Kindred Lore, which is a collection of writings by Cain, his childer, and his grandchilder. It is this book, supposedly first written in the land of Nod, east of Eden, that captures our daytime nightmares and makes every night a painful journey from ignorance towards truth. Still, I savor every moment of my own life. I savor the feeling of the crinkly old skins through silk gloves, turning them page by page. My hands shake with pleasure while holding soft, cool lights and reading ink that was newly dried when Charlemagne was young. I savor the gentle, quiet terror of reading cuneiform tablets that threaten to crumble at my very presence. More than that, perhaps more than immortality itself, is the quest that burns within me. It is the search. I have traveled all over this world, 
perhaps even more than any other of my bloodline. Where my eternal quest takes me, I shall know no fear. Though small of frame and frail of body, my heart is strong and my blood stronger. I am not afraid to go to those shadowy places where the far-flung fragments of our father's teachings lie resting. I have gotten lost in the raw brutality of New York, sipped tea with the governor of Kingston, made lifelong enemies in Johannesburg, hired the best diggers in all of Cairo, fought to get through Casablanca, learned about ancient steel and ancient monuments in Toledo, dug in the white cliffs of Dover, barely avoided a death brawl in Dublin, sneaked past watchful eyes and breast, and liberated ancient tomes from a monastery in Cologne. I have saved 14 sacred scrolls from the torch in Berlin, sipped the best coffee, and talked to the greatest Austrian scholars in Vienna, learned ancient Sumerian from a Methuselah in the hidden tunnels under the University of Prague, and braved the colder, coldest winters Oslo had to offer. And yet, I did not do this by my wits alone. Barely a night goes by that I do not thank our founder for his foresight in providing me with the secret ways of hiding the way to see beyond sight, and the voice of command that seems to come so easily to our line. And I have long blessed my warrior friend, Karsh, who taught me the secret of seeing in the dark and sleeping in the earth. And yet, I wonder what else our founder provided us with. My sire and his sire seem to have fallen under a horrible curse, a madness, dark and quiet. At first, but soon growing to a terrible loss of coherent thought and communication, has seemed to strike them. Can I be far behind? My Tremere friend has written me, saying that the burning need driving my bloodline might be the cause of the madness. It must be true, for I cannot fight the burning desire for more knowledge. It is as difficult to resist as the need for sleep, or the need for blood. It is perhaps this madness that which I fear the most which has compelled me to go to press with this translation in haste. Know that I do not intend to break Raphael's fragile masquerade by putting these words into print. It is my intent that a scant ten score of these books be printed, and that none of the copies of this book, of this book be given into the hands of the sons and daughters of Seth, as our father commands us in the Chronicle of Shadows. I must publish this now, however. It is the most complete collection of the Chronicles of the Book of Nod that has ever been gathered. No other translation, not even Critias's Codex of Cain, has been quite as complete. And yet it shames me to say that this is not the complete text. No, far from it. I have seen whole fragments go up in smoke and flames as flames consumed ancient buildings. I have touched a complete book in the tomb of an antediluvian and watched it crumble to dust. I know that in the catacombs under the tabled lost city of gold, hidden deep in the Amazon jungle, there are thirteen stone fragments said to contain specific words to each of the thirteen tribes of kindred, but I only glimpsed them once before I was forced to flee. And so I can barely boast of having part of the puzzle, the largest part to ever be assembled, true, still, only a part of the whole. I have chosen English as it is my native tongue. It is, in my opinion, the one language which most ably dances between the ancient concepts of Sumer, the noble language of ancient Rome, and the stentorian incantations of medieval Germany. I must beg forgiveness for its glib, simplified action in some cases. However, I will forever defend my choice. The King's English will serve well, especially since so many of the original texts are forever lost to me. It is perhaps particularly perverse that I follow the threads of memory to each fragment of this book, and yet I know that there are those out there who harry me at each step. I know that Amalek has himself had a hand in thwarting me once, and other Methuselahs as well. It is difficult to find, for example, lists of the names of the Antediluvians and the Methuselahs, for they know that in names there are power, and they, out of fear, that some mage would learn to control them with it have blotted their names out of their histories wherever they have been recovered. I have luckily managed to discover a few of them, but I suspect these to be falsified names that were created by the Antediluvians to throw me off the trail, so I offer them here. This may be the only way in which we may identify certain Antediluvians. Furthermore, I have fallen into the habit, regrettably, of referring to the founder of a clan with the nominative of the clan's name. For example, Malkav equals Malkavian. This is admittedly sloppy scholarship, but I have been left with no choice. 
Once I learned the true name of Bruja's antediluvian and discovered my own name carved in my forearm the next evening, I promptly swore to never again seek the names of those founders. I am quite sure that, even as I write these words, there are agents of the Jihad who are following me. I will not join the common room downstairs tonight for last night. I indulged in some wine-sotted blood and saw a woman with silver-gray eyes looking at me. She was wearing Venture's scepter sigil on her cloak. I know it was her watching for me, searching for me, sent by Venture to harry me. No matter. I will write the truth, and the rest of you be damned. I have attempted to compile these textual fragments into some kind of coherent story, at least within the context of the various chronicles. Where you see an ellipses, know that there are more words on that particular scrap, but that it has somehow been lost, erased, or hidden from me. I wait now only for a package from London to finish this missive, and have done with this book. This package will carry one of the only copies of the Codex of Cain left in existence, and will be the last piece in my complex puzzle. I look forward to touching it, holding it, with great expectation. And if any of my brothers or sisters come near it, I will... I will send them to the death of fire. Let Michael's holy sword brand them for all I care. No one has come this close. I will reign triumphant amongst my kind. With triumph, Aristotle de Laurent. With this, I think it is also paramount, and equally of importance, that we touch on the foreword, also mentioned in the Book of Nod before the actual scripture begins, titled, A Brief Word on the Chronicle of Cain. It is unimportant that this part of the Book of Nod is not comparatively accurate with the standard biblical canon. What is important is that we have, perhaps, for the first time, a personal viewpoint on the events surrounding the days after the fall. Cain tells us, in his own words, what his motives were, and although it is quite possible that the story exists only to shape our idea of him, we can assume that there must be some element of the truth to his tale. His account is, after all, the only eyewitness report we have to rely upon. Ah, our dear father, in some Islamic myths the translated Satan figure is thrown away from heaven, not because he hates mankind, but because he loves God too much to bow to any other but God, and he will not serve man. It is perhaps that Cain shares in this love he so loves his brother and that he cannot think of any other worthy sacrifice to the one above. Surely Cain could not have had any other reason to sacrifice his brother. He could not know death, having been born before death was something humanity had even experienced. Other figures of that time also play instrumental roles within the book. Surely it is not purely mythological transliteration that causes Lilith to appear in the story, for she is a figure in the oldest of the Hebrew mid Midrashim. Having been cast out of paradise first, she would recognize Cain for one who had been in the light of heaven and subsequently cast out. There are those among my colleagues who believe that this stanza should represent the idea that Lilith, mother of magic and demoness herself, taught the first disciplines to Cain. Others see her role as being a midwife to our father's awakening to his own magical potential. Rema what remains to be discovered is the fabled Cycle of Lilith, which supposedly describes the time Cain spent with Lilith as her servant and lover. Was it, mere, was it merely a dalliance, or could it have been some kind of mystical apprenticeship, during which Lilith gradually drew out of Cain the limitations that the Divine had placed upon him, and slowly awakened him to his own magical powers? The fact that she shows trepidation at his drinking her own blood from the Awakening Cup might point to her lack of total understanding as to what exactly this might do to the first son of Adam. We cannot afford to speculate whether the cup causes a hallucination in Cain, or whether Cain is actually physically transported to a wilderness somewhere within the darkness. This is not understood, neither is it explained by the translation of the original text. The original phraseology essentially means breathed in or moved. Both meanings of the word point to either explanation, and we cannot gain much in the debates. It matters not whether Cain was physically transported. Like, shamanic vi like shamanistic visions recorded as a result of ritually consuming hallucinogenics, Cain's experience was as real to him as any journey might be to you or me. My child, Beckett, continues to restate his opinion that the Chronicle of Cain is a vampiric parable. I entirely disagree, but Beckett is a beloved child. I will include his studies and findings here below. Before I continue, it is paramount that you realize that De Laurent and Beckett share widely differing views on the subject matter we're about to get into. 
I will speak more on the subject after I share Beckett's viewpoint here in a moment, but I want to make it clear at this point that the Book of Nod is a highly controversial piece of text, and at the end of the night, I want you to draw your own conclusion, and all I ask is that regardless of your beliefs and opinions, you don't wield them zealously or fanatically, lest the masquerade will punish you, likely severely. Let us continue with Beckett's assertion. Because of the literary distance between the current translations of the text, Dr. De La Dr. De Laurent's translation included, of the Book of Nod, the original intent of the book has been lost. It is my theory, based on my own researches, that the stories of Cain and Abel, Cain's curse, and his subsequent meeting with Lilith are parables created to tell the tale of the first kindred in such a way that even the simplest of us can understand them. Through my own scholarship and drawing upon the work of the fundamental Cain scholars in the world, including some captured writings by a black hand worshipper of Cain, I have created a story which I believe harkens back to the original parable of Cain. In the time after humanity went from a hunter-gatherer society to cultivating farm animals and developing agriculture, there were two tribes named for their chiefs. They were called the people of Cain and the people of Abel. The people of Abel were herders and animal husbanders, and were more primitive than the people of Cain. They worshipped a great sun god who was a warrior who lived in the sky. The people of Cain were agricultural and were more civilized than the people of Abel. Because it was so important to time to the harvest, the people of Cain worshipped the moon goddess, the dark mother who was both the fertility of earth and the mystery of the moon. Yet not all of the people were happy. Chief Abel attacked Cain's people, telling them that they were inferior, and cursed because they did not hunt like their sun god hunted. Cain's people did not know much about fighting, but Cain taught them how to use the sharp things that they used to till the soil in order to kill. When Abel's people came back to torment them again, Cain's people fought back. All of the men, women, and children of Abel were killed. The sun god of the people of Abel then called them cursed as a people, and laid a blood curse on all of them that they would wander without a home in the wilderness. He burned their villages, insulted their fields, and told all of them to turn away from the people of Cain. The people of Cain were unable to recover. They wandered in the curse for many weeks, until they had no food to eat and had many troubles. Then the priestess of the Dark Mother, who lived beyond the moon, came. The priestess offered Cain's people respite, succor, and surcease. She taught them magic, taught them how to hunt, and taught them to drink blood. The sun god came to Chief Cain in dreams and told him and his people to return and subjugate themselves to the will of people of Seth. Chief Cain refused. Then the sun god told him that all of the people of his tribe would be forever cursed, and it was so. But the Dark Mother said that there would always be a way to overcome this curse. If the people of Cain would come to her, through her mystery, she would free them from the curse of the sun god. In this parable, Cain's people, and Cain, represent our need for civilization, the humanitas that we constantly seek. Abel's people, and Abel, represent our animal natures, our wild selves, the beast that lies within us. The Dark Mother represents the mystery that guides our very existence, the magic of our blood, the power of disciplines. We must seek the mystery of Dark Mother while dealing with the legacy left behind by the sun god, the curse, ergo, a beast I am, lest a beast I become. Golconda is held out as a final goal, perhaps balancing all of these things and showing the transcendence of the beast within. And there we have ever so simple Beckett. While I find many of Beckett's findings highly entertaining and enlightening, this is one of the few times I feel as though I am witnessing a scientist who's learned so much that he's oversimplified the problem within his own mind, without further reviewing and comparing more minute or specific details. Regardless, this entire foreword serves as an excellent point that scripture is no more than dogmatic philosophy, and if you can separate yourself from the dogma attached to it, the gleamings one can gather from said scriptures are usually undeath-altering, changing the direction in which you had been going. As we continue the series, I hope that in your undeath, you can find some form of semblance of belonging or direction within kindred society, be it from the Book of Nod or some other form of information I am able to relay upon you. For now, may the shadows guide you, and I bid you adieu. Good night. Hey there again, fellow kindred. Real quick, I just want to say thank you for watching this video. Uh, feel free to subscribe and like and comment and all that good jazz I'm here and all that fun stuff. Um, I, If any of the wordplay in this video confused you at all, um, be sure to check out my Lexicon series. It'll be coming out um, very soon. 
Uh, it'll uh, it'll cover all the words and, and weird terminology and stuff um, used, uh, starting with like the general basics that all vampires should know, um, continuing on to more sex-specific terminology. Um, and hopefully, <laughs> it'll become much more digestible, because I know that the uh, Vampire the Masquerade terminology can be very in depth <laughs> as i've been accumulating it and organizing it i'm finding that out so but stay with me and stay tuned uh these videos i do not have a consistent rate for which they will come out that being said i hope to be somewhat consistent nonetheless so once i have that figured out and how long this entire process typically takes um i'll have a better schedule for you guys but in the meantime uh enjoy the night and i will see you guys later